e il percorso per questa nuova laurea magistrale è un percorso lungo due anni, abbiamo iniziato a parlarne forse anche più di due anni fa ed è stato un percorso che ha incontrato favori immediati e anche opposizioni immediate, non è stato un percorso ovvio perché come sempre quando si introduce qualcosa di nuovo, qualcosa che è già eh, profondamente eh, diciamo, inserito, testato e, e consolidato, c'è sempre il timore di fare un errore. Allora la critica principale è stata ma la persona che formiamo con questo corso di laurea ha ancora le caratteristiche che rendono il fisico così particolare non solo nel mondo della ricerca ma anche nel mondo dell'accademia. Ovviamente questo è, eh, scusate la ricerca ma anche nel mondo dell'industria, scusate. Eh, non è una contaminazione che fa perdere le peculiarità eh, del, della formazione che abbiamo, che abbiamo attualmente ai laureati in fisica. Ecco, la nostra scommessa è che questo nuovo corso di laurea aggiungerà competenze nuove e le affiancherà a quelle tipiche di un fisico e quindi renderà, formerà delle persone che avranno delle capacità che vanno molto nuove, moderne e più eh, attuali. Quindi sarà una figura che avrà le caratteristiche del fisico e avrà delle competenze più moderne nel campo della, della gestione di dati, di dati complessi. Ecco, questa è un po' la storia, ringrazio tutti quelli che ci hanno lavorato, ringrazio la scuola, questo qua c'è il professor Beltramini che ci ha appoggiato fin dall'inizio, ci ha aiutato in questo percorso, ringrazio tutto il comitato ordinatore, non li nomino perché non voglio dimenticarne qualcuno e non nomino nemmeno il presidente perché ha lavorato, vero, ha lavorato ha lavorato, però hanno lavorato tutti quanti, quindi non lo nomino, tanto dopo parla. Un'altra cosa appunto è che da quando io sono direttore del Dipartimento di Fisica e Astronomia ho avuto occasione di incontrare diverse aziende, diverse realtà esterne al mondo che noi identifichiamo con il mondo della ricerca. E ho scoperto realtà di ricerca veramente estremamente interessanti, in cui si fa ricerca ad alto livello, ricerca che è utile per la società, perché è utile uno sguardo come quello che ha un fisico all'interno di un'azienda, perché è uno sguardo che è in grado di cambiare prospettiva, di vedere le cose da, da più punti di vista. Ed è questo sguardo che è il, eh, diciamo, il plus che ha un fisico quando esce da, dalla sua, dal suo percorso di formazione. E allora questo corso di laurea ha eh, appunto due focus, ha il focus del fisico che sappia gestire le, i dati che noi con cui abbiamo a che fare in questo, in questo momento, e che saranno sempre più complessi andando avanti negli anni e che sappia nello stesso tempo possa gestire la mole di dati e dati complessi eh, anche per il mondo diciamo, esterno, anche con ricerche fatte in un mondo che tradizionalmente non è pensato un mondo di ricerca e questo devo dire è, è veramente un, un peccato perché in altre nazioni la ricerca si porta avanti anche nell'industria ed è molto importante e questo farebbe, renderebbe la nostra industria un'industria moderna e non soggetta a, così, a oscillazioni a seconda del vento che tira. Ecco, detto questo, io adesso ho parlato fin troppo, lascio la parola a Marco Zanetti che è il Presidente del Comitato Ordinatore del corso di laurea magistrale in Physics of Data. Dopo di lui parlerà il professor Jeff Byers che con un suo articolo ci ha ispirato proprio il titolo e il nome del corso di laurea magistrale. Grazie. Ok, ringraziamo la professoressa Soramella, direttrice del nostro dipartimento. Uh, now we switch to English, ok? Uh, 
the reason is uh, twofold. Uh, we have uh, our guest here, and so it's uh, really nice if you can understand what we are talking about. And then we are also recording the, uh, these two presentations in order to provide materials for, let's say, foreign students, uh, let's say, to get information about uh, uh, what uh, this thing is about. Um, yeah, let me just add the fact that uh, with respect to what Francesca said uh, about the program of the day, so indeed uh, I'm going to give you now an overview with some details about this new uh, master degree in physics of data for something like 25 minutes or so. And then uh, Jeff is going to give us, uh, as I said, uh, an overview of uh, his thoughts about uh, the connection between physics and, uh, and data. And after that, around midday, you are all welcome to, let's say, celebrate a little bit uh, at the milk bar just beside the uh, Palazzo del Bo, where we're going to offer you an aperitivo, okay? And uh, we're going to celebrate it all together. Okay? Okay, so let me start um, describing this, uh, this project. So this is just a slide that summarizes all the features in a nutshell. Um, indeed, it's a master degree as Francesca said, aiming at combining the classic features, if you want, of a physicist, meaning like capability of problem solving and all this kind of stuff, with those of a data scientist. Essentially, the, all the tools that the data scientist can manage in order to, uh, to solve numerical issues, uh, uh, extract information from, uh, from data sets, and so on and so forth. Um, let me stress from the very beginning that this is a master's degree in physics. So everybody who graduates uh, in uh, physics of data is going to be a physicist, okay? I mean, also from the bureaucratical point of view, okay? So the class di laurea, as we said in Italian, is the same as the physics uh, master degree, the standard one, okay? So there's no distinction in terms of, uh, uh, if you want, uh, academic profile, okay? So we are going to graduate physicists. So <coughs> where all this starts from? It starts from the fact that uh, gathering, processing, interpreting, extracting information from complex and large data sets is at the core of modern science. Not just physics, but modern science in general. Okay? And not just that, as you well know, now the, uh, let's say, the managing of the data, the analysis of the data is at the core of the digital revolution. The social media, uh, big data, all these things that are revolutionizing our, our world actually relies on the fact that uh, now we have uh, the tools, both uh, if you want intellectual and material, uh, to indeed process and extract information from complex and large data sets. So, given that, we thought that uh, uh, if you want providing uh, an education for physics students that uh, uh, that allows students to gather those those uh, those competencies is is uh, is, uh, is worthwhile. Okay. So we, we do have a twofold goal, okay? um, which indeed uh, stands on the request from the market, if you want, of uh, a figure that is capable of processing data and extracting information from it. So physicists typically are, are very well uh, settled in the, in the uh, not just in the academic world, because of their capabilities uh, of, of solving let's say, complex problems. And of, uh, um, of let's say, and of their smartness, if you want, it. because if you manage to graduate uh, in physics, it means that you are not that dumb, let's say. Uh, but to some extent, we also want to uh, to provide uh, physicists that would like to continue their uh, their path into the acad academic career to get the tools that are needed from day zero, from the very beginning of their academic career to tackle uh, complex issues, okay? And that's indeed uh, a mixture of physics knowledge and data science knowledge. And of course, we are all here because, I mean, indeed in October, we're going to start with the first classes. Okay, the name comes from uh, this very nice article by Jeff, okay? And I'm not going to say anything because he's going to talk about that uh, in, uh, in detail. Uh, let me just mention the fact that uh, after the very nice uh, 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 paper in, in Nature, uh, there has been an editorial commenting on that, which basically encompasses all the things that uh, we thought beforehand 
being our uh, milestones in, uh, let's say, creating this, uh, this, uh, this master degree, okay? And essentially, this editorial from Nature again became our, our manifesto. And here, I, you know, I just picked a few um, passages from the text. And essentially, there is, you know, people advocate for a greater exposure of physics students to statistics and probability as well as information theory. Okay? This is really like physics students should be more exposed to this kind of stuff. Okay? And then, as Jack will said in a, in a moment, uh, it may come as a surprise how much connected are the, you know, the technology that uh, have been developed in data science and what has been the, you know, developed in, in physics uh, years before. And you know, again, something extremely important that are I mean, I'm just citing the text. There are countless companies that are willing to pay for scientists that are able to, let's say, achieve this kind of uh, goals with uh, such uh, competencies. Okay. And you know, as a, as a as a really you know illuminating ending, we need a new generation of physicists equipped with those tools to rise the challenge that uh, you know this, this uh, modern science uh, poses. Okay. So. Just to give you an idea, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, what the rest of the world is doing about that, there has been an explosion of, explosion of uh, you know, uh, master degrees in data science all around the world, of course. But I must say that we are somehow uh, unique in the sense that several data science uh, courses um, are, let's say, of general scope. Um, some other are declined towards uh, some disciplines like economics, or statistics, or um, you know, biology, and so on and so forth. We are among the first developing such a, a training path, an educational path, uh, combining physics and data science. Okay, and of course, this is uh, very well supported by uh, you know by all the bodies that are related to that. So, in particular, uh, the Muir, the, our minister. And the Ministry for um, Education and, and Research uh, wrote a couple of years ago a document uh, somehow supporting and inviting all the um, universities in Italy to develop such programs. Okay? And just last year, five new master degrees in data science have been, uh, have been funded. Okay? And not just that, also, uh, not just uh, in the rest of the world, but also in Italy, there are several initiatives at the PhD level that are taking, uh, you know, an input if you want students with such, uh, with such, uh, such uh, education, let's say. So, just to cite two, Bologna is a data science PhD program, and Normale di Pisa, uh, together with other universities uh, uh, in the area, is also developing a data science uh, uh, PhD uh, course. So, first of all, I mean, uh, it must be said that uh, if you just get an idea about uh, creating a new, uh, a new master degree. Uh, of course, I mean, you need to check that uh, your project is somehow well received in the territory, right? Uh, it's not just, you know, just have this idea and then you go for that without checking whether this is interesting for, uh, let's say, for the outside world. So that's the first thing that we've been uh, asked. And together with uh, the School of Science, uh, Mariano Petramini and, uh, and uh, the administration there, we set up, um, let's say, a process of revision of, uh, let's say, this, uh, this initiative that we had by checking whether this initiative uh, found, uh, um, let's say, good feedback in the territory. What, I mean, what, do, what do I mean with that? Basically, we check whether tech companies, research centers, financial institutes, public administration, and all that were happy about our proposition. Okay? Whether you know, this, this thing basically was uh, somehow supported by uh, the outside of the academic world. And actually that was the case. So we had a public event in September 2016, together with the other master degree that we have here in Padova, data science from, mathem in the, from the mathematical department. And also we had we circulated a questionnaire uh, with, uh, you know, we contacted 25 partners and uh, half of them replied. And we, all in all we had an excellent feedback. Okay? So basically all these companies said that you know, we were doing uh, an excellent job and the idea was a very good one. But also we, we got indication about things that needed to be corrected and so on and so forth. 
Uh, basically, this also was very important in order to set the, the basis for collaborations with uh, such uh, you know, partners from the outside, uh, from outside the academia. Okay? So, uh, this is very important because, I mean, we do plan to have uh, internships for, for students. So, these are just put some logos as a reference for some of the partners that we, that we had. So, these are from, uh, they go from CERN to Unox, that uh, is a company that makes, uh, you know, uh, Owen, industrial ovens, uh, you know, supermarkets, uh, INFN, all these kind of uh, institutes from really like, from uh, a very large spectrum of it. Okay, now moving on to something more, uh, Related to the to the, uh, to the course itself, so in terms of generalities, uh, as you can understand also from the way I'm speaking, the classes are going to be in English, okay, all of them, but that's somehow standard now. Uh, the same holds for for the Laura Magistrale in physics. So we, we do have uh, um, a selection for admission. So we're going to accept at most 40 students. 30 from uh, uh, European students and uh, 10 from non-EU uh, countries. Um, in order to get into the, let's say, to be admitted, uh, of course, uh, a bachelor degree in, uh, in physics is enough, uh, but it's also enough uh, to get enough credits, CFUs, uh, in physics for students that say that uh, they graduated like in engineering or in mathematics, let's say. Um, so we do expect to have a, a mandatory internship at the end of two years in a private company or in a research institute. Okay? So that's going to be basically essentially the, the end of, uh, of the path, of the educational path, uh, which basically goes along with the, with the thesis itself. And you know, the project itself cannot stand without a, a close collaboration with other master degrees. So essentially, I mean, uh, our say mother, this is uh, the, you know, the master degree in physics. But also in some uh, more technological oriented ones, like uh, the one from uh, the Department of uh, Information Technology uh, that is called uh, ICT for Internet and Multimedia. So, going a little bit more on the details, we're going to have, of course, three semesters of classes, and every class is going to be of 48 hours, uh, six CFUs, uh, credits. Uh, we, we proceed to have six new mandatory uh, classes. And we somehow keep the same structure that is there in our standard master degree, the physics degree. That is basically, uh, okay, they're not formally implemented, the three curricula, but essentially people can choose the area in physics, in classical physics, that they want to specialize into. Okay, so they're going to be somehow the choice of specializing in uh, physics of fundamental interaction, physics of the universe, and uh, physics of matter, like condensed matter, and so on and so forth. And of course, I mean, we're going to, we try to combine theoretical classes and uh, tech classes in a, in, a, you know, in a proper way. So it's going to be like a very fine-tuned, uh, 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 let's say, calibration of these two, uh, these two components. And uh, we also expect a lot of hands-on sessions, okay? So uh, classes where people are required to actually do stuff, okay? Not just study, but also uh, do things in lab or exercises and so on and so forth, okay? And as I said before, the final exam is supposed to be uh, coming along together with the, the internship uh, work, essentially. So now, moving a little bit more into the details. So th this is a table uh, with the, the courses uh, foreseen for the first semester of the first year. So we're going to have um, one of the pillars is going to be this laboratory of computational physics. Okay, that's going to be the lab for, for this uh, for this class. Then another pillar is going to be these. Uh, the, the the, the course that is called Management and Analysis of Physical Datasets. Okay? Then we're going to have the theory uh, class, and then we have machine learning, which is a, a class that is uh, taken from ICT from, for Intel Multimedia. Okay? Um, and then the, there is a, a fifth class that is supposed to be taken as an, op let's say, as an option from uh, the one that are available in the standard uh, physics uh, math degree. Okay? So the second year, sorry, the first, uh, again, the first year, but the second semester, we're going to have uh, the second part of uh, the lab uh, class and the management of and analysis of physical data sets, plus uh, advanced statistics, uh, another course more theory-oriented, that is uh, statistical mechanics of complex systems, 
And, um, and then again, we have one class from those uh, offered by, by the standard master degree, the standard physics master degree. Okay, and then the last semester, if you want, so the, the first semester of the second year, we're gonna have just one compulsory uh, class. There's gonna be uh, information theory and computation, essentially there's quantum computing, if you want. Um, and then we're gonna have uh, uh, one, sorry, um, we, have, we need to have a couple of classes from a list of tech-oriented uh, classes, again, taken from uh, uh, either from the master degree in physics or from uh, the uh, ICT for internet multimedia master degree. Okay, now let me go a little bit more into the details of the new classes we're going to have. Okay, so the first one is, uh, as I said, laboratory of computational physics. Um, essentially, it's targeting this class is targeting the learning and the practicing, as I said. So the end-on part is really important of modern techniques of data analysis and processing. Okay, so. It's going to be one year long, divided into two parts. And the first one is going to be, I'm going to take, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give the, uh, the first class. And essentially it's going to focus on the Python ecosystem uh, of scientific libraries. And it's going to basically use those to uh, teach people how to manipulate data sets, how to visual, visualize data sets, how to extract features from, from the data sets, how to statistically interpret those data sets, how to run a multi color simulation, and so on and so forth. Then the second part is going to be devoted to project, essentially. So the first, uh, some hours are going to be dedicated to advanced, uh, the application of advanced technology in, uh, in uh, machine learning. Okay, it's going to be given by Mark Baezi. And then students are going to group together and going to, uh, let's say, um, basically um, uh, set up, uh, let's say, a proper experience in uh, from the proper measurement, if you want, or let's say analysis in a given context. So basically, they're going to be proposed, let's say, analysis in, for instance, in RAC data, uh, satellite data like plan, uh, genomic data sets, and so on and so forth. So basically, the, the lab part, the practical part, is going to be uh, on, uh, let's say, modern data sets from the various areas, okay? And this is going, going to be supported by several experts from, uh, from the various fields, okay? So we need to thank, I mean, uh, both INFN the Instituto Nazionale di Nucleare for providing experts, but also, let's say, some other resources, uh, together with the Department of Physics. We have uh, this very nice uh, computing infrastructure, it's called Cloud Veneto, uh, which is a very uh, powerful uh, data center. And students are going to be able to, let's say, going to be allowed to use those resources in order to, uh, to accomplish their tasks. Other than that, we, we, do, we do have a new lab of 120 desktops, as you, as you know. And so that's going to be basically our, our, our classroom, essentially. <clears throat> so the second pillar is, uh, is, is the so-called management and analysis of these data sets. And basically, uh, it's just a fancy name somehow to uh, address the flow of the data from the sensors to the end users through computing and uh, processing and so on and so forth. So you know, all this class as well foresees two parts on the two semesters. The first one is going to be um, taught by Gianmaria Colazzuol and the visiting professor from CERN, Emilio Meschi. And uh, basically it's going to review the data acquisition systems, the trigger system, the controls, the networks, and communication protocols, and so on and so forth. The second part is going to be taught by Donatello Lucchesi and another visiting professor, either from INFN or again from CERN. And it's going to be basically uh, our big data uh, class, if you want. So it's going to be first covering the, uh, the if you want, high-performance computing, and then, the, as I said, the management of large data sets, big data-like, if you want. And again, this is going to be done in uh, uh, collaboration with the lab, uh, the lab class. Okay, so people are going to be asked also in this case to, let's say, to put their hands on, on things. Okay, now moving on to more theoretical-oriented classes. So the, the first one, it's called Models of Theoretical Physics, and it's going to be given by Amos Maritan and Marco Baiesi. And here, basically, you have the list of things that are going to be covered. So, starting from basic tools, then uh, they, they're going to move to emergent universality, uh, then to classical field theories, then stochastic processes, then quantum physics, like final path integrals, harmonic oscillations, so on and so forth, and then finally, a homogeneous uh, interactive system. Okay? Then again, another tech -orient sorry, uh, theoretical oriented class. Now moving to the second semester, if you want, of uh, the first year, 
This is going to be taught by some of your and essentially this, uh, you know, the, the, the motto of, the, of this class is uh, from models to data and, mac and back. And basically the, the, uh, the course aims at making use of both analytical models and simulation. Again, hands on to apply models to real systems and combine practical approaches to, with data mining techniques. And this is going to be done again in groups of individual projects. And then the, the, the program uh, goes through complex networks and random graphs, auto equilibrium interaction of particle models, example application in ecological in ecology and neuroscience, and so on and so forth. Now, another very important class, another pillar, is statistics itself. So you, you guys had already some of you know some statistical classes, uh, which unfortunately did not have the right amount of hours if you want to, you know, to, to be properly taught, probably. So now we're going to have a, a full-blown uh, 48 hour six uh, CFUs course on that. And not just on reviewing, you know, all the theoretical aspects on, uh, on statistics, but, and most importantly, putting their hands on things such that those statistical things are going to be learned, okay? Because doing stuff is the only way you have in order to do, and in order to, to you know, to, uh, to digest and to swallow and to, uh, to make your, the, uh, those, those, those techniques. So indeed, I mean, uh, Alberto Carfagnini is going gonna, is gonna to give this class, and I don't want, want to go through the things. These are some of the standard, standard stuff, but the most important thing is that you're going to apply these things essentially using R as a, as a software tool uh, on to, uh, you know, use cases taken from uh, several, uh, several fields. Okay, so I'm, I'm already at my conclusions, okay? So we do have uh, now a new master degree in physics in Padova, okay? which is complementary, it's not substituting, let me stress that, it's not substituting the standard master degree, absolutely. We have a fantastic standard master degree in physics. Uh, this one is, uh, is, you know, is a parallel offer that we uh, give to students, and uh, indeed it's some, somehow special and somehow innovative. Okay? And we, we are starting in, uh, in fall 2018. Okay? So people can gather information about this class, uh, this, this, this course, in the under development site that we have, uh, you can check, you can click on it, uh, the, the link, unfortunately the link is not there, but it's, it's easy to find somehow. Uh, that's, you know, that's a snapshot of the first page. And uh, rather soon, we're going to first have, uh, let's say, our syllabus available online. And once that, once that is uh, going to be there, people are going um, to have the chance to actually sub pre-subscribe to the, to the class itself. So the, the window for, for subscription, sorry, is gonna, um, it's gonna be between May and September somehow. And in September, the committee is gonna select the 30 people that uh, uh, would like to join the, 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 this class. Um, I'm essentially done. I think that we have some time to take questions, that I have some time to take questions, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the floor to Jeff. So if you guys, especially students of course, have questions about this, uh, that's the time to do so. Yes, please. Um, are you supposed to know Python already? No, you are not. The question is whether you are, uh, you guys are supposed to know Python already. The answer is no. I mean, we are actually, you know, teaching that as, you know, expressively for you know teaching uh, people such things. So you are not. Other questions from students? Yes. What, what are the admission criteria? Yeah, sorry. That was a pretty important one. So, we do not have, um, let's say, super well-defined uh, criteria. Uh, essentially, if you read the, uh, the application uh, page, essentially, uh, we base our selection on the CV, on the curriculum of the, of the person. And the curriculum essentially reflects the academic uh, records of, uh, of the students. So essentially, you know, the grades that you got uh, till then. And essentially, um, I mean, for instance, uh, um, a motivation letter would be welcome, for instance, expressing you know, like the interest that the students got for, for those kind of things. Uh, then there is, there is a necessary condition is a B2 level for, for English uh, because I mean that's the same I guess for, for physics as well uh, and then there is a minimum grade 
uh, bachelor level that is of 85 or 90? 90, 90, it's 90. Okay, that's, that's the minimum grade that you need to get in order to access. Uh, and then, you know, essentially we're going to review also on the basis of indeed the curriculum and the motivation, let's say. Okay, if there are, no, yeah. Compared to the other degrees in master degrees in physics, uh, what is done in a minor way? Oh. Because if you want to do more about data, we have to do less about other things. So, what are the, uh, these other things? That, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, somehow, um, if you look at the uh, um, at the curricula uh, in, uh, in the master degree in physics, you basically see that in addition to the exams that you take in order to specialize in uh, the field that you've chosen, there are several other options to complement your education in that sector. Okay? So essentially, we remove that thing, that option, and we inject if you want more like, uh, you know, data-oriented uh, classes. If you want. Okay? But to some extent, I mean, also, as I said, one pillar is the laboratory. So instead of having the, the, you know, the, the standard lab, one semester plus the advanced lab of two semesters, now you basically have one lab of two semester, semesters dedicated on data analysis, essentially. So uh, that's, that's another different difference, I'd say. But in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, amount of information that's going to be given in physics is very similar to, to, you know, to because as I said, I mean, the, our first goal is to graduate physicists. Okay? We don't want to, let's say, have you know, engineers or anything. I mean, we do want to have physicists, uh, uh, in a, let's say, exiting our, our class. So if there are no other questions, I think I can leave the floor to Jeff. Okay. It's always the first test of a talk if you can get the projector to work. So, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Byers from uh, Naval Research Laboratory. Thanks so much for in inviting me here to speak to you. It's, it's a little bit intimidating to give a talk that's named the same after a master's program description, so I hope the talk is quite good. Uh, it would be a letdown if you said, well, the, the talk didn't make much sense to me and have an entire master's program about it. But this is uh, actually a talk I gave uh, three years ago at the American Physical Society to uh, people, younger people, and uh, trying to speak more broadly about the uses of physics outside of physics. But I'd like to emphasize that this leverages what you learn as physicists. You know, to reiterate what Marcos was saying, the goal is not that physicists need to become data scientists, it's that physicists bring something unique to the picture. So it's actually quite critical that you are trained with a mindset of being physicists, okay? We have plenty of data scientists, people in computer science. Physics brings a very interesting perspective to the problem. So, the place where I start this is, why, why is there a resistance to data science and statistics in physics in many ways? And I think this quote captures it by Ernest Rutherford at the uh, early part of the 20th century which is if your experiment needs statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. So there's a sense in physics that if you need to do data analysis, you should have done a better job in the laboratory thinking about how you did your experiment because physics only needs relatively simple analysis for good experiments. But the trade-off of that is you may have to go to the lab and do a very, very hard experiment when you could have done a rather easy data analysis for a more complicated, less perfect experiment. So in a sense, uh, I would say physicists have been spoiled by the high quality of experimental physics. So that theoretical physics hasn't really had to work with bad data, challenging data. I didn't say big data, but bad data. <laughs> Because a lot of the data you run into the world is very messy, very complicated, very hard to understand. It's not like the results of experimental physics that you're trying to analyze. 
So if you imagine a kind of anti-physics, this is what people at Google and Amazon and Facebook and others actually deal with, which is massive amounts of data, but it's an enormously high dimensional space it's drawn from, and how that data has been acquired is very, very complicated and, poor, and poorly understood. So it is not like experimental physics. It's something else where the experiments are very bad, but you have lots of them. Now, it's unclear if that's good to have lots of bad experiments, but somehow that's what you often end up dealing with in the real world. So, the field of machine learning is kind of like what computer scientists did to reinvent statistics because they didn't quite want to learn statistics. But by this day, it now has sort of come back together where it's understood that machine learning and statistics are essentially the same thing. Machine learning tends to think about data sets where they're in very, very high dimensions with fewer samples than dimensions. That just tends to be the situation you're in. So there are a lot of different fields that play into machine learning, and some of them were mentioned earlier in the curriculum of the master's degree you're setting up. Certainly statistical learning theory, probability and statistics, information theory is very important. It's an area, it's one of those areas in a physics training that is somewhat of a deficit that we don't learn enough information theory in physics. Signal processing people know are very useful in computer vision and also control theory and robotics. Control theory has many interesting things that physicists should know about from that domain. And of course, there's the word artificial intelligence and cognitive science and the neural networks, such as you're seeing in deep learning currently. So just to start off real quick, you know, one of the key topics in machine learning is supervised learning. And I'll describe some of the other types of learning in a moment. But the essential idea of this problem is that you're taking some space, a feature space, and you have some labels of it. This could be cats and dogs. It could be whether you saw the Higgs boson or not. It could be anything. It's very abstract. And so in this space, you're trying to figure out, when I have some summary label, what of the space is identifying to that label. And then when I project it through the space for classification, what of these labels can I actually identify in testing on the other side? But an important part of doing this work is that you often have your original data and you need some way to turn it into a feature vector, some sort of feature, that you do this analysis in the lower part of the screen in. And finding this feature vector can be quite important depending on what algorithms you want to use. And I'll describe some of those algorithms. So when you're analyzing these kinds of data sets, you can often think of them as high dimensional point clouds of data. And when you look very close at these point clouds, they tend to look random. But if you pull back in from these point clouds and look at them in a more coarse way, they have structure in them. And so many of the algorithms that you need to use are trying to identify the scale at which this happens part where you just see noise, and it looks very high dimensional, Gaussian noise, like on the left, or where you begin to see structure emerging like those on the right. So since machine learning is a, it's a little bit of a buzzword now, and it's, it's uh, important to understand, I want to just go through a quick description of the components of machine learning so you have some idea what this term means. So on the right here, consider these points. These points are colored, and that's indicating some sort of label. That label could be of, uh, like, again, some sort of an animal type or a certain kind of data set, a certain sort of elementary particle being detected. There's just something where we have data in some space, and we have some label assigned to it. And we would like to do, figure out the function that takes us from the data to those labels for things we have, don't have labels for. So this type of analysis right here, where you put boundaries between the data and you try to separate the labeled groups with hyperplanes or boundaries, is typically called discriminative, okay? Discriminative meaning you're discriminating between the different data sets, but you can't generate new data. There's no model here for how the data is created. You're just telling the data apart. We have labels, so it's supervised. 
So supervised discriminative learning with some examples there. Neural networks typically fall in this category. Perhaps some of you have heard of SVMs, support vector machines. They're like this as well. Now, unsupervised learning means I don't, I don't have the colors over there. I don't have any labels. So it's more like I just have to take the structure of the data without any labeling and figure out how I would organize it and group it together and put boundaries between these points. Again, it's discriminative. We have no sense in which how the data got created. So for instance, a principal component analysis is like this, and K means clustering, which you may have heard of, works this way. Now, this is actually more like how physicists think. Generative. You think of how to make a model where you could understand how your data was generated. Okay? We don't tend to think discriminative models in physics. So a generative model says I have some understanding of a probability of how it was made. And these are examples for how to do supervised learning in the generative framework. And I like to think of it as like you do have the labels, they're colored, but you sort of have a prototype, a center of a probability distribution. You have a sense of how they're grouped around the probability distribution, creating examples from it, as shown by the circles. And then finally, in the case of unsupervised generative, you don't have the labels, and it's really like density estimation. We're trying to estimate the density of these points. And for instance, deep learning at it in its featured vector discovery stage is more like that, as you're finding these structures. But this is very much, density estimation should be something physicists are very comfortable with. This is something where you're trying to figure out how the data is actually being created probabilistically. So again, our ability to look at these point clouds and zoom in and zoom out and not be lost in the structure here of the noise and begin to find more of the structure at the right scale is critical to algorithms. And uh, a lot of the data can live in very complicated high dimensional structures. These are just examples that are used in sparse graph theory, but they illustrate the point that the data can exist in these high dimensional spaces in very complicated ways. Now you might ask, why would data have these structures in these high dimensional spaces? So this is just a simple example of showing how, imagine a uh, space where every point in that space represents the configuration of your hand. That's all the angles of all the joints in your hand and how it's positioned. So if I go to a point in that space, it corresponds to the way your hand could be. Now think as I move around in that space, those are all the trajectories or geodesics that your hand can change between as it changes shape. And there are certain places in that space where my hand can't exist. My fingers are broken, twisted back, and I can't actually achieve those locations. So there's a structure in the space. It may be 60 dimensional in all the angles that I would have to specify my hand, but it's actually much lower dimensional when I look at the configurations it can actually acquire. And that's called a constraint manifold. It's often used in robotics and other places, but your data in physics, for instance, also obeys these types of constraint manifolds. There's constitutive equations that limit the values of variables within the models. And this is also true within data sets, within these point clouds. The trouble is, unlike in physics, where you might have a nice theory about what those equations are, you don't really have that theory in the case of arbitrary data sets you run into the world. So what you have to start out with is merely a set of points. And you may have to figure out a graph that connects the points in some way. And then you would say there are smoothness assumptions that connect this all together to make a manifold. So part of the challenge is, like I showed earlier, that you have to not be lost in the noise at the local scale of the problem and figure out the right length scale to get to to see the structure. So you sort of have to pull back and find tangent spaces, if you will, and locate how these tangent spaces sit within the larger space. And then these models, these local models, have to be stitched together. And so this is manifold learning. This is how you start with just mere points and figure out how to find the differential geometry of a structure within the data set. And this can be a very powerful way to look at data, especially when you're trying to reduce the dimensionality, which is very advantageous. So this is something, um, I haven't used this slide many times, but I think it's quite interesting because uh, I'm not sure if you've 
learned about Lie groups in uh, classes about group theory and symmetry. But there's an interesting connection between where these labels come from. Because, of course, the world does not come labeled. Somehow, we are generating the labels. Our language is created to represent the labels. Labels get created in disciplines like physics and chemistry and biology to find data structures that exist in the experiments that we've done in the world. But the question would be, how does this exist in an abstract data space? And in many ways, this jumble of data here on the left is often represented by some, can be summarized by some symmetry operation, some operation on pieces of this data that we then claim all this stuff is the same. You apply this symmetry operation, something from a Lie group. A Lie group is just a, 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 a space of continuous operations you can do on an object and stay in the same space. And so like with this number four here, you can rotate the four, you can shrink the four, you can shift it around, translate the four, but in a sense, we keep the same label, right? And so all these transformations keep the label invariant. Now on the far side, you can see that these types of structures could layer together, and so they form subspaces nesting within one another. And so the labeling is actually related to what symmetry operations you can apply to data and retain some key features. Now, to a physicist like myself, this sounds very familiar. <laughs> this is like applying symmetry operations to something and looking for invariance is, you know, the bread and butter of a lot of physics, especially high energy. So a background in physics provides a, some key ideas for how you can understand one of the most tricky problems in machine learning is where do labels come from. So this is the shift, and this is actually, I would say, maybe the most important point in the talk, and so I, would, I want to emphasize this, is that at least in my background and the background of a lot of people trained in physics, at least in the United States, we don't have enough exposure to the Bayesian formulation of how to think about science and how to look at problems. And so this is, this is changing. This is a different way of thinking. So think as physicists, you're often taught that your data is sort of a noisy version of something some model created. And you would like to say, well, I'm going to fit my noisy data to this model. The Bayesian framework flips all of that around. It's, a, it's very pro-experimental. Whereas the other version of physics, physics is very pro-theorist, I think, very theoretically oriented. This is saying that let's imagine instead that our models fluctuate around fixed data. The data is what you measure. It's fixed. And think about the model space as a place where there's all these possible models that could explain what that data is. So let me go through the formula, because maybe some people are unfamiliar with this. So look at the term on the, in the middle here, the likelihood. That is the probability of the data given your model. That is usually how physics is taught. Physics is taught where here is your model, whatever it is, let's talk about what kind of data you can see from it. And it's a probability over the data, so it's noisy data from this fixed model. The prior over here is something we don't usually talk about in physics and think about, but it's actually something we are familiar with. It's the probability over the possible models. It's what model could there be here to explain the data. It says how broadly are you going to think about the possible models to explain your data. And finally, on the left here is the key. This is the posterior. This is actually the thing you want to know, not the likelihood, not the probability of the data given the model. You went in the lab. You measured the data. You have the data. The model is the thing you're not sure about. So you want to know the probability of the model given the data. The data is fixed. It's been measured. Wonder what model it's related to. So you want to know the probability over those models. We seldom speak that way in physics about understanding our models. So the models, in this line at the bottom here I'm reading, the models are instances of a stochastic process that fluctuates around the data. This to me is a fundamental change in your mindset. 
So you may have seen Bayes' formula, and you see it in a statistics class, and it glides by, and somebody says there's some frequentist thing and there's some Bayesian thing. As physicists, I think we can really take this right here and absorb it and say this is a good way to think about how you interact with the world and do physics. So just as an example of how a Bayesian technique works, this is just showing you some coins being tossed and it's showing you how there's a dynamics induced, a learning dynamics whereby as the data comes in, what you thought was the possible models What you thought were the possible models changes. So, if you look at the green line right here, this is called an uninformative prior. It means I, for the bias of the coin, I don't know if it's a 50-50 coin or there's a bias to the coin. I'm saying I'm open to any idea. And the green line says that. The red line says I think it's more likely to be tails. When you flip that coin, probably, I mean, sorry, heads more often. The blue line is saying tails that it might be tails much more often. But as the data comes in, and since I programmed this, I know that the answer actually is it's a 50-50 coin, there's a convergence. Even though we start with different views, there's different opinions at the beginning before the experiment happens, the data comes in and watches this prior out and tries to drive everybody towards the same answer. And that's an important aspect to how the Bayesian inference process works. So, what are these priors? Look, these priors sound strange and odd, and where do they come from, and what does it mean for a probability overall model? Well, I would argue that essentially what you're dealing with here is that you already know a lot about priors over models. Okay? For instance, the uh, Ising model is a good example of understanding how to form a prior over all systems. And the Ising model is a very interesting one because it can form many different structures on data sets. And in a moment, I'll show you some, how it's used in machine learning in your vision. But the space of just the, the interaction string and the resulting magnetiz magnetization of the Ising model, which is, of course, a standard model used in every course on statistical mechanics, shows you the, the wide diversity that a physics model can have in explaining what goes on. It's always fascinating to the data science and machine learning people. They're always like, well, where does this all this stuff come from? And why do they call it a variable spin? And it's like, they don't know where these models come from, but we do. So this very model is used in computer vision to do segmentation of an image. And figuring out, for instance, an example at the bottom is, where is the tree in the foreground of this image? And so what's happening is that you're doing a decomposition where the spins in one direction are grouping together and the spins in the opposite direction are becoming the background. And so this is a statistical mechanics model that can do an effective job of doing a computer vision task. And a lot of physicists don't, aren't aware that these techniques are being used, and they're actually very effective. Now, I would say, since they came from our field, we should appreciate where they're being exported and how they're being used. And uh, something important to note here, too, is this prior that I mentioned, the prior, the probability of the models. It's very much, you can think of it as the negative logarithm of the prior is like the Hamiltonian. So if you're learning about the Hamiltonian in your courses, and you say, well, that's great, that's just some operator that's related to energy conservation, or so, or some invariance of in time, it turns out that the negative logarithm of that probability, the prior is related to it. And that's actually a very powerful insight. We'll come back to that later in the talk, how the negative law of a probability is one of the most important concepts you can know about. And the Hamiltonian captures part of it. So in statistical mechanics, this is the, uh, this is the um, talking about how hierarchical structures play a role. And there are many hierarchical models in physics, of which like the, the beta lattice, this is one you talk about in statistical mechanics classes, forms this, this structure of a tree that branches out over and over and over again. And this hierarchical way of looking at things has become critical in a lot of applications in computer vision and machine learning. There are many things you can summarize with probabilistic graphical models 
Now that's a term that we don't typically use in physics, but it's very closely related to mean field theory. And so in mean field theory, you're often factoring probabilities, like in your partition functions and statistical mechanics. And so you can form more complicated mean field theories or variational mean field theories through these sort of hierarchies. And so these hierarchies are used to understand, like on the top there, the breakdown of what a person is like walking. Because there's a structure to your skeleton. There's a hierarchy to it, and the resulting motion reflects that information in the data set that's in the vision application. And there are many, many other examples of this. So I'm going to just walk through very briefly one where you have some labeled data here. So imagine you have something simple like a tiger and a rabbit as labels. And you want to understand it as a, in a hierarchical way how that data gets created. And so pull the labels away from a moment and ignore the labels and think of it actually as a hierarchy of textures and parts, parts of the animal, and the geometry that that texture and parts is put together in. Okay, that's the hierarchy. Now, you can, and I'm not going to go through this, this is like the partition function, the probability for that model. Okay? Now, this is obviously a very complicated slide, but the point is, this is sort of like the equivalent in the world of machine learning of what a Feynman diagram is. This is where you can write down the structure and read off the probabilities and how they're related, much as you do with a Feynman diagram, like in a particle physics. So let's go back to the picture and say, imagine now we have our, we, we assign our labels back, but we built this deep hierarchical way of thinking about our data. And now we can actually um, create new data. We can synthesize new data because we have a rich representation, a generative model, like we tend to build in statistical mechanics and other parts of physics. We can have a generative model where we can select from within the space of textures, parts, and geometry, create data that's almost like the data we trained on and we used to find this hierarchy with, but can be different. But we can also, in some odd way, dream up things we didn't see that are quite different and combine these parts to create objects here that aren't quite like the ones we trained on because we learned the parts and the hierarchy. And so as we find these different things, we can find things that are further and more different than the original data that we found that combine things from the data set in ways we saw no data for. And we can even imagine things that we're unlikely to have ever seen, where you've combined aspects of the object, almost as like a dream. And this is almost people, cognitive scientists talk about this as a way you can create objects in your mind you've never seen because your brain is actually using this type of hierarchical representation to combine things together. So this is a segue now to diffusion. Diffusion, a concept developed in physics, is a very powerful modeling technique, of course, in physics. But it's also a very powerful technique in machine learning and data analysis as well. And so briefly, the, the Google PageRank algorithm is an example of detailed balance, a concept in statistical mechanics, where you figure out how probabilities and the transition probabilities within a very complicated network are, are evened out so that there's no flow anywhere in the network anymore, that it's now evenly distributed across this network. And this is the first half of the PageRank algorithm that you <coughs> They, they, they probably don't use this anymore because this works very well when you're merely a perturbation on the web, and so you're measuring the web. Unfortunately, Google has become so powerful now that they are a perturbation of the web, but they're strongly coupled, and they can't actually do a, a, a weakly coupled experiment like this to the web anymore. They have to figure out how to, they're strongly coupled now. Because Google, the page ranking of, of Google actually controls where people go on the web and so distorts this kind of thing now. So the physics of the web is quite different once you have this strong coupling like Google has now. But it used to work this way with simple diffusion. And so let me just pose um, a, a problem to you that's an interesting physics problem. So just think of it as a physics problem for just a moment. And so this is about 
Let's have n particles. We have n particles, and I'm going to show them to you. And imagine they're just moving around randomly, and maybe I'm showing you snapshots of them as they're moving around in some environment. And your goal is to figure out what is the potential, what is the potential energy well that's holding those particles together as they move around. Now, I never saw this problem asked in physics, you know, in statistical mechanics. But it's a quite fascinating problem because it forces you to confront the data analysis issue of seeing diffusion as sample in space and time. And so from this, you have one instance of seeing the particles. Like, let's say over there on the right, that's where the particles are at one instance. And from that, you have to do your best job of figuring out the potential that's holding them together. So you can, in fact, imagine that where every particle is is like a delta function. And you can use, let me go to the next slide. You can, in fact, use the Green's function for diffusion. I'm not sure if everyone has seen that yet in the course, but certainly if you were in this master's program, I imagine you would. You would use this Green's function, which to the machine learning people, they, we would say in physics it's a Green's function. They call it a kernel. Green's functions become kernels in the world of machine learning and statistics. And so you relax this Green's function in time around all those points you see that you measure, and you try to figure out when the probability flow away from all the points and from the other points around them becomes even. And if you can do that, you can actually find a local asymptotic that will show you what the potential is that these particles are likely to be sitting in. And so again, it's this potential U, which is related to the negative logarithm of a probability. Yet again, this negative logarithm of a probability shows up. And so when you imagine seeing some particles, these blue points I made right here, and this is the probability distribution they actually came from, the black line here. Here is the red one, which is the inference of that line. You can now look at the potential area. The negative logarithm of that shows you the potential that they're sitting in there. The black line is the true answer, and the red line is one instance from a particular sampling of what you think the probability, what the uh, potential would look like. So let me show you this, which is kind of interesting, at least to me. It's that imagine I give you different numbers of particles to look at. I only give you 25 particles sitting there, and I give them a snapshot. And then I say, well, what, is, what do you think it looks like to wander around in this posterior I was mentioning, this basin posterior, around the true answer? And so with only 25 particles, you can see that the red line here varies quite a lot around the true answer which the particles were drawn from. But as I add more samples, this constraint holds the inferred potential more tightly around the true potential. So if you want to think of it, and this is actually, a, I think, a fairly effective way of thinking of it, sample size in doing data analysis is very much like uh, temperature in statistical mechanics. And as I'm, as I'm having more samples, and I'm constraining this potential more and reducing its fluctuations, it's as if I'm decreasing the temperature in the system. And this is not just a vague analogy. Because of information theory and its relationship to statistical mechanics, this is actually a very strong mathematical analogy. Hopefully one that's pursued in the master's program <laughs> in uh, understanding how information theory, uh, uh, information theory and physics are related to one another. So I'm going to shift now and talk a little bit about information theory because I think it is so important. And several times here, I've talked about the logarithm of a probability. Now, this is called self-information. So if you have a probability, you think, well, that's a very useful item. But it's, in fact, very useful to have the logarithm of one over the probability. And if you do that, it acts a lot like that potential. Remember I was saying the potential energy those particles were in were like negative log of the probability, right? Same as log over the one over the probability. And you can compute something called a relative self-information, which is a potential difference. You can take the potential difference between two of the, you know, the potentials, and you can say, all right, well, that would be the law of two different probabilities. And what this information does here is it helps you measure how much is in a probability distribution that is surprising to you. That's actually
essentially the key idea in information theory is understanding the surprise of seeing any particular piece of data. So for instance, this is a Gaussian distribution on the tipped on its side here. And in the middle of that distribution, there's not a lot of information because you can expect there'll be a lot of samples drawn from the middle of a Gaussian distribution. And so when you encode it, and this is here I've done what's called a Huffman uh, encoding, which is a technique in information theory. And what it does is it, it assigns very few bits to the things that are common and a lot of bits to the things that are uncommon. Because that way you would can do the maximum compression of the probability distribution into bits this way. Because mostly I'll have most of my information from the middle and they'll have very few bits associated with them. But if I go out on the tails of this distribution, that's a lot of information. That's very surprising to see something three or four sigma from the center of a galaxy. So there's many, many bits associated with that value, of high information content. It reminded me when I saw your logo of uh, uh, physics and data that your logo actually had very much the structure of the different the differing information content in the bit string that Now this is what happens when you take that same length of those bit strings and you look at their length and you compare it to the negative logarithm of the probability. That is a uh, quadratic. That's like x squared. So in other words, in the sense of data analysis, if you wanted to know what the equivalent of the simple harmonic oscillator is, the x squared information potential, it's the Gaussian. That is the object that is naturally associated with x squared. So to me, this is, a, this is an important insight in how information potential and distributions are closely linked. And they have a very close link also related to statistical mechanics problems in physics. So entropy, certainly a physics term, so imagine I average this self-energy, I mean self-information, over all these probability distributions for this. I get the interval over p log p, negative p log p. Now this is, this is like statistical mechanics again. But this is an information entropy. There's no Boltzmann constant here. That's the one difference. Now there's another one we don't usually talk about in physics called the kullback liebler divergence, which is the one below, it's relative self -energy. This is the average over the potential difference. And this quantity over here on the right is often used in machine learning and statistics for comparing probability distributions. This is a, a key quantity to measure the difference between two distributions. And so measuring the distances between probability distributions is somewhat of a, an alien concept, I think, in physics. But it's a very powerful one. And so I want to give a quick example as I'm getting uh, you know, close to which is, let's take two examples of the letter frequency in English and the letter frequency in Spanish. And so I'm just reducing Spanish to just 26 letters so I can match it up against English. And let's pretend in the simple model of the languages that the letter frequency captures some extent what's going on in that language. This is not a very good assumption for a linguist, but we'll play along here for a moment. And so now we would like to know how far away is English from Spanish. Now that sounds like a really weird question, right? But remember that prior I was talking about Bayesian inference and that probability over models? We have to figure out how far models are away from each other. And so we actually need to understand the tools that can answer strange questions like how far away is English from Spanish? And so let's just try to compute that. So this callback Euler divergence, which remember is the average of the potential difference of those probability distributions here. So now I can see minus the log of each of these and I'm comparing them. I can actually compute how many bits per letter there is if I try to encode Spanish with English. So I say I'm going to pretend, I'm going to make a mistake, let's say, and think that I'm encoding English text as efficiently as I can. I assume the probability model on the top but I, you actually have tricked me and feed me Spanish. And so I am inefficient in encoding it because you're drawing from this distribution, Q, not P. I think it's P. And so what's happening over there is you're seeing how many bits per letter more 
do I need than I would have expected to encode this information? Now, I can flip that around. It's actually not symmetric. This isn't a distance quite yet. It's a divergence. And so we encode English with Spanish, and we find that, well, you're only off by 0.19 bits per letter. And this is just an example showing if you did Morse code, how, you know, like more U.S. Morse code obviously is built for English. So if I encoded Spanish to the Morse code, I would find my simple links would be longer than I expected. And this is a measure of the efficiency in information theory of encoding these probability models. So we haven't quite got a distance here. And so we do have the fact that this, this, this value is positive. It does equal zero if they're both the same, but it doesn't obey the triangle inequality and it doesn't obey symmetry flip between them. So in some sense, right here, English, the distance between English and Spanish, or the difference between them, depends upon your perspective. It depends upon are you looking at English from Spanish or Spanish from English. Because they're in some sort of space, some space of model. And they're, they're in fact on the tangent spaces of these models, and you're comparing them via projections on these tangent spaces. So if you wanted to build a true distance between the languages, you would have to start thinking about forming a geodesic. A lot like you do in uh, relativity and in techniques in physics, where you actually stay on this manifold, and you build this geodesic that moves between these two points here. And I don't have time to show you exactly how you do that, but there are a lot of equations there. There are Lagrangians and things that you optimize in order to do this that are actually very much a part of your physics education. In fact, your, your training in classical mechanics comes back and proves very helpful because it teaches you things about functional analysis and variational calculus. And you can figure out the geodesic that uh, measures the distance between these. And it's, the measurement is in bits. It tells you how many bits away these, well, these two languages would be. And it's symmetric and obeys all the rules of the distance. But it is in a space that is curved. And so you saw earlier that the space of data, those point clouds, you might have to find structures with them that had curvature in the data. But this is making a, a point, and, and the simplest way I can figure out how to, is that the space of your models is also curved. And you need to understand the curvature in that space as well. And so, there is a metric tensor that you can try to infer, and they call it metric tensor learning. So, in fact, I would say a class, all, I mean, we used to joke in, in graduate school, it's like the people really going into general relativity were truly <laughs> heading off in a very challenging direction to find jobs and find something, you know, practical to do in the world. So this was very interesting to discover that being able to determine the metric tensor, like you try to do in Einstein's theory of general relativity, has a very important application in understanding the space of models. And so knowing that physics and knowing that mathematics actually provides a powerful toolkit within data analytics that a lot of people don't have. I mean, you know, here I'm, I'm on the booster side of this right now, which is if you're interested in this master's program, these are the things that you would learn possibly and know that other people don't know and understand. And that gives you advantages. That gives you advantages in thinking about physics problems, okay? But it gives you also advantages out there finding jobs in other areas in case you don't actually work in physics. And this was a real eye-opener to me that even the most abstract areas of physics that you wondered about their applications suddenly leap out and so provide an amazing way to apply them to very different types of problems. I mean, if, the, if discovering the metric tensor can help you get a job, anything's possible. <laughs> so, sort of wrap it up here, the last few slides. I want to summarize in this chart this relationship between the different ways of thinking. And this is the relationship between probability, information theory, and geometry. So this, this took a long time for me to think of this, but it sort of captures something very important that I never learned in a physics class, which I would have, I'd love to be in class that would have taught this, which is we can think of probability as density estimation of something, putting a measure on a space and finding its dense, the density of those points, those point clouds, for instance. 
But there's a deeper way to think about it, which is to hop over the top here and say, think of it as a potential, a potential energy. And so the potential energy is merely the negative logarithm of that probability. And we can think in terms of, of potentials, like we do in physics, and take the differences of them. And those turn out to be like the fallback wheeler divergence when they're average. But there's a sort of even more interesting level you can go to and say there's a geometry to this as well, where I can actually look at the space as it's curved and bent as it holds the data or the models and see it as a metric tensor in that space. And so I can move between these different ways of thinking mathematically, as I've shown here. And those of you who have some familiarity with um, uh, differential geometry or uh, general relativity will recognize this square root of the determinant of g is a, a key factor in many of the energy functionals in general relativity. But in another sense, it's just the Jacobian. So it's the Jacobian showing you how you move between coordinate systems. And so the logarithm of that object is also related to this information potential. And then, seeing how we go backwards from information potential back to probability, that should certainly look familiar to everybody. This is something you'll see in statistical mechanics, of course, right? This is the Gibbs term. So to a physicist, I would say this is a very natural way to think about probability, potential, structure of geometry, and this is all about thinking about data, okay? But a physicist can actually have a good intuitive grasp of this sort of relationship. And you can make hybrid versions of it. That's what's so powerful, is that you can say, I can be in a Euclidean space and talk about the probability in that space. Or I can go to the other extreme and say, there is some manifold that captures the data. And it's all about the geometry of that manifold. And so it's completely geometric. But perhaps even more interesting is that you can have mixed representation. You can say, like in the middle here, where I have the sphere that has um, inhomogeneously sampled things. They're still on the sphere, but they're inhomogeneous on the sphere. You can have both. You can say, I want to know about probability distributions, but they live on some manifold or some set geometry. And that's the key, because physicists can bring knowledge into the problem and they can say, I know something that constrains what this problem can be. And that often is this manifold that is on. And then you can figure out, I'm going to learn the distribution on that manifold. And that actually captures what the data set's really doing. So when you do this, this is a, the last, really my last point, that physics went through a crisis in the early part of the 20th century. And that crisis wasn't really felt by other disciplines. But it was, it was felt in physics because we had to confront the fact that we couldn't be in a coordinate, one coordinate system. We had to be in any coordinate system. This is what Einstein wrestled with when he was trying to formulate general relativity, which is that you have to be coordinate invariant because the coordinate system that you use to represent your physics or your data is something you invented. That's something in your head. It, it cannot be that you take a coordinate system that you created in your head and push it out into the world and make something happen, right? You should be able to make up whatever coordinate system you want, throw it in the world, be able to change between them, and there's no real thing in the world that you care about that, all right? That is a critical piece of the training in physics. Right? You learn that in field theory, you certainly learn it in dealing with relativity and other things. And so this, this invariance I'm talking about here is that saying, if I give you a map, you can have whatever map you want, but if we say we're going to meet on the highest peak on the surface of the Earth, it better not matter what map we use. If you use your map and I use my map, we have to agree about a physical result out there in the world. That is not a concept that really exists in data science. Okay? They don't get this. They don't understand this coordinate invariance idea that you should be learning in physics, or you should be asking your professors to make sure they're teaching you. Because physics was almost destroyed by being confused about coordinate systems and what the physics was. And it was fixed. And so physicists have a special duty to transfer this knowledge to other parts of data science. Okay?
mean, I cannot tell you the number of times where you run into people in data science, computer science, they're getting confused by this problem of thinking there's just one coordinate system to be in, which is not true. So, to wrap things up, a few takeaways here, which is that this hierarchical structure that show up, especially like in deep learning right now, they have a lot to do with coarse graining the degrees of freedom. And coarse graining the degrees of freedom is a powerful modeling technique that was developed in physics and in mean field theory and things like the beta lattice, restricted model. Learning a geometry from a point cloud has a lot to do with diffusion. Point clouds are ubiquitous in data sets out in the real world. Diffusion is one of the most powerful ways of doing it. And knowing about Green's functions and how they get used in diffusion, and then realizing Green's functions on manifolds is what the machine learning people call kernels, is very useful. You know, because they just pick kernels. They just pick a kernel and say, well, I just kind of like this kernel. As a physicist doing data, you can actually figure out what the kernel is. You can derive the kernel. It's a part of the process. Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference, that prior we were talking about, the Bayesian prior, that's related to your Hamiltonians. That's related to stochastic field theory models. Any stochastic process that you know of or you learn about in physics, that is a candidate to be a prior in a, in a Bayesian inference process. That's a very powerful thing to have in the toolkit. Measuring distances between models related to the ideas of entropy. If you add a little bit of the information theoretic interpretation to your statistical mechanics class in your background, that is an incredibly powerful tool to understand entropy better. I understand entropy better than I did when I was just working in physics by dealing with it in data. Because you really have to confront what it is. And the other thing is the spaces that data and models are in are typically curved. They're curved spaces. And so understanding how to deal with curvature in spaces is a powerful modeling tool as well as it's developed in physics. So these are five examples, I think, that make a strong case for if there is to be something called a physics of data, it can be based around things you're really learning in your physics classes, and they're quite powerful. So that is, that is the end of the talk. Um, I do have the references that I can give to the organizers and when they post the talks. So if there's anything that was interesting in the talk, um, this is all kinds of either books or articles that sort of talk about the different components here and you can go and read about these things yourselves. Um, these are sort of, it's like a list of the books that influenced me over the years as I sort of change from a theoretical physicist and to be more uh, interested in the data side of the problem. Um, but at that point, I'll stop and uh, take any questions and go from there. It's like you have to be 
be very careful about the knowledge going back and forth. So if you're saying, let's use the analytic tools to understand the, the neuro, neural connectome, right, the connection, and using a statistics, a hierarchical statistical mechanics model to do that, I think these techniques can be used for that. And then I'm just more cautious about using that information and bringing it back on the data analytics side. Uh, thank you. About this uh, back forward process, uh, do you think that, so you, you showed us how physics can really give you inside, inside new way to, to, to look at the data. Uh, do you think that also from the other way, there is some backward uh, information in the sense that the data science, um, things that the computer vision uh, developed can have? Well, there, there is an example of that, which is one example that I mentioned, you know how the greens function is actually like the kernel? And then, this is what physicists do, in my opinion. It, it's a, it, we have a kind of a guessing game where we guess Hamiltonians or Lagrangians. And so we say, here's a Hamiltonian, here's a Lagrangian, and we're going to go use it in statistical mechanics or quantum field theory or something. The, the, the machine learning crowd has reversed the problem around. They're guessing Green's functions. And so they guess the Green's function, and then we could say, oh, well, you could guess this impulse response Green's function and try to figure out what the Hamiltonian is if you want. But their problem is they think about the data and they're thinking locally. They say, I'm here at this point in the data, and I think locally about what's going on there. The physicist doesn't think that way. The physicist thinks, well, there's a symmetry property. There's some operation of symmetry on my problem. And so you tend to think about this Hamiltonian and Lagrangian type of viewpoint. Now, neither is right or wrong. It just depends upon what type of problem you're working on. It can actually be advantageous to think more locally about problems. And so you may want to, in some circumstances, guess the Green's function instead of the Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. And so that's maybe something that's coming back the other way towards physics. We don't typically do that, right? We derive the Green's function from Hamiltonian and Lagrangian. Any other questions? Okay, I think we can thank Jeff again.